Oh, hang on. Hang on. Sorry, hang on. Yep. Hi, and welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to our webinar on the Good Governance Academy. I hope you found yesterday's webinar very interesting. And today we've got a, an even more interesting one on digital transformation. Um, if you're new to the Good Governance Academy, please have a look at our Good Governance Academy website. We have events that happen regularly, and the events are all recorded, and the recordings are available after the events from the event page, should you want to share it. We also load the videos to YouTube, so if you want to join our YouTube channel, you can have a look at all of our previous events there on YouTube. Uh, see, we're getting a nice uh, lot of people coming in now. Um, please tell us where you're from. Use the chat function. Thanks, Baba. It was very nice to see you online again. Um, from Zimbabwe, lovely to see you online. Please let us know where you're on, you, where you are from using the chat function. Um, we also have available today the Q and A function. What we do is we use the Q and A function if to ask questions, as it might get, you know, the questions might get mixed up in the chat function. I've also enabled today the reactions or the emojis. So if you have a look at your reaction functionality, you can try it out now. Um, just to, if you like what's being said, you can clap or you can uh, thumbs up and there we go. Thank you so much. And let us know that you're enjoying the webinar. So a little bit about the Good Governance Academy, train uh, the Good Governance Academy's Training Academy. The <clears throat> Training Academy was established a couple of years ago, really to um, endorse uh, good training uh, courses that are available around the world. So people apply to be endorsed by the Good Governance Academy. We take it through a rigorous process to ensure that it's uh, up to standard. And then we endorse the program and we have showcase events like we're having tonight. Everyone that attends an endorsed Good Governance Academy training course has a certificate of attendance or completion. And those certificates from the Good Governance Academy can be used for CPD purposes for professional designations. So I'm not going to spend much more time on that, but I'd like to introduce today our guest. Our guest trainer is Gary Hardy and Frank Wanda. Just a little bit about uh, Gary and Frank. Um, Gary is the founder and owner of Executive Education Online. He is affectionately known as Mr. Cobit, as Gary is one of the three creators of the Cobit framework, which forms the foundation of the IT Professional Association Isaka. And as we're talking about digital transformation today, um, you may be familiar with the COVID framework and Isaka. Gary has always been passionate about enabling business leaders to deliver value from technology. For as long as I've known Gary, he has beaten the drum of enabling his clients to improve their performance by facilitating adoption and implementation of new capabilities. Frank is very similar. Frank Wanda is the founder of an organization called People Productive, a company dedicated to helping businesses outperform because of their people. Frank is a former Fortune 250 Turnaround Chief Information Officer, or CIO. And most recently, Frank was the CIO for at the Guardian Life Insurance Company of America. Frank has a similar perspective to Gary's and coaches his clients to unlock stronger business results by improving human performance. In fact, he is so passionate about this topic that he wrote a book called Transforming IT Culture, How to Use Social Intelligence, Human Factors and Collaboration to Create an IT Department that Outperforms. So with that introduction, I'd really like to welcome Gary to introduce us to the course and, and the endorsement of the course in terms of its alignment with the Good Governance Academy. So over to you, Gary. Thank you, Carolyn, and uh, welcome to everyone. This is really exciting for me. It's been, a, I have to say, quite a long time coming, partly because it's been a long time of thinking to get to where I've gotten to, and I'll briefly explain that actually in a moment, uh, but also you know, the involvement we've had with the Good Governance Academy has been another huge uh, advantage uh, in my mind. It's governance has always been a big issue for me. Well, not just an issue, but well, it's an issue because I think it's often misunderstood and not good sometimes. And so the combination of the Good Governance Academy, 
um, this educational opportunity and and this webinar today, you know, really is bringing together something I've been driving, dreaming of almost for a long time. And and it's it's kind of weird that if I thought think back to wait when I started my journey on this, which is a long time ago. I mean, it's getting on for thirty to forty years ago. I probably never imagined that I would now be one hundred percent driving education. That was not really what I thought I would be doing, but that's where I've gotten to. And I suppose it's the culmination of realizing that. Um, you know, the only way to help people understand is to sort of educate them, but not educate in the classic sense of going to school or passing a test, but just helping people find the way by making them more aware, you know. And um, and and the reason I focused on executives is because I've always in the, my whole journey, look, I did computer science. I, I don't say when it, it, it was a long time ago. And I've always been fr I'm super keen on technology. I, my whole house is wired up completely. Um, uh, but I've always been passionate and frustrated by the disconnect between technology people and everyone else. And the danger of people who are in a lead leadership position just leaving this to someone else. It's a bit like parents not bothering to look after their children and not even caring what doctor they go to you know it's not right and it's and that's why often things fail the other thing i just want to briefly explain and thanks so much to frank for joining me today because the other journey and you know carolyn mentioned like people call me mr cope it's a bit a bit sad in a way but i was <laughs> convinced years ago that the problem was just was to do with good practice especially in the it world you know that that the problem is people just don't follow even the basic common sense, good practices. But the truth is that, um, that it's not just good practices. Uh, governance became another passion back oh, it's 15, 20 years ago. Um, and COVID got extended to include governance. And governance is obviously important. And we all know that, you know, in the Good Governance Academy. But the thing that I didn't realize until, and I wish it had come, the penny had dropped a lot earlier, but it was by meeting Frank and his team back in 20, 2016 or seven, 2018, I think it was. Yeah, I think so. so. Everything, yeah, everything depends ultimately on people. I mean, it, it's sort of obvious, you know. Even AI depends on people. It, it's never going to be fully automated. And, um, and you can have the best practices, the best so-called governance system on paper, but if the people are not... Um, managed correctly or not working in the right kind of environment or have issues of their own that aren't being recognized it doesn't matter how good those things are it won't work and so so this became the final piece of the jigsaw puzzle and from an educational point of view the other thing I want to quickly explain is that uh, you know having spent years we're a proper train we were in our training organization under another umbrella called IT winners that's my the original company and for years, we've done the so-called certification training, but there is a place for that, but it doesn't solve the problem of changing organizations. It, it might improve the skill of an individual. Even that I question sometimes, you know, based on people holding up a piece of paper that's based on simply two days of learning. Um, you know, tell a doctor that that's how you get to be a doctor. He'll laugh. It's, um, it's experience, it's application and so forth. And the other thing I realized is if we are reaching out to senior people, they don't want lots of detail. They don't want lots of technical jargon. They need crisp, quick messages, but it's got to be something that inspires them to act. You know, something that sounds, boy, I wish I'd thought of that. And, and thinking, hmm, you know, maybe this is going to make a big difference. And so that, that led me on to reinventing the whole educational approach and using technology actually to help. And so what I'm going to do is today, we're, we're going to do this in two parts. I'm going to go through, let me just move the slides forward. Um, I'm going to go through a quick overview of this particular course, which is uh, the Executive Guide to Digital Transformation. I'll connect it to the Good Governance Academy's training sort of criteria. And then I'll just show you a little bit of the content. And then for the rest of the, the session, we'll have an interaction. I hope you guys will ask me lots of difficult, and Frank, <laughs> some difficult questions and get some discussion going because uh, I feel this is this is a potentially, um, I don't know, kind of a, a, an answer to a, a way to crack a nut that we've been struggling for years. So in terms of 
How, why is digital transformation, you know, important to the Good Governance Academy, and why even have it as part of, of, um, you know, the training academy's offerings? Digital transformation, like anything to do with technology, is really a business change. It's, and this is the other frustration. Uh, being an IT person for years, I just wish we would stop saying IT. You know, it's it's like IT or technology is in the air we breathe. It's just everything that we do revolves around it. What we are actually doing is running organizations and changing organizations and improving the way things work. A digital transformation is trying to harness, you know, digital technologies to improve our organization's performance. And so, and from an outcome point of view, the outcome isn't to implement the tools, it's to achieve the result of those added technologies that might enable us to connect with our customers better or improve our supply chain better or whatever it might be. It's a business outcome that's important. From a corporate leadership point of view, and this goes back to what I touched on earlier, the success will only happen if we engage together and it's led by the people who want the business outcomes, not led by the people who want to implement the technical solutions. I mean, it's a, it's a combined leadership, but we have to have the people who want the business outcomes driving you know, the results and supporting the results and supporting the investments and asking all the questions, you know, making sure that we're on the right track. Yeah, this is a, this is just not something you delegate to people. You've got to own it. There's absolutely zero question about it. And, you know, your point earlier about IT as some separate thing, IT just happens to be the automated piece of the business. If you go back in time, we had mostly operational activities with some IT. Now we've got mostly IT activities with automated operations, and that mix is changing more and more, quicker and quicker. And so people have to work together in a very, very kind of very deep and collaborative way. And the owners have to really own stuff, like you say, Gary. Yeah, look, it's it's everything that we do. I mean, it's not even just at work, of course. Our our children, yeah. our our lives, our devices, everything has technology in it. So so mm -hmm. it's about time we just treated it for what it what it really is. And look, and the the third element here, which is obviously from a good governance point of view, you know, that the real purpose of good governance is value adding outcomes that really help the people that we serve. You know, our stakeholders, our customers, our staff, our people, um, and and that can only happen if we take the transformation uh, objectives to be value adding objectives. And we know what those value added objectives are. And we have a discipline from a leadership point of view of ensuring that we're monitoring and achieving and then sustaining those really beneficial outcomes. And the other part of, uh, of the Good Governance Academy's training sort of criteria is that it should be sort of integrated, you know, that our thinking should be holistic. And and so, you know, what we've tried to do in this guide and then the other ones that we're doing uh, on similar topics is show it as a collaborative whole endeavor. You know, it's not just leaders. It's leaders and everyone else. And of course, everyone is a leader at some point, you know. So so I just wanted to explain that um, as how we're connected to to the Academy's, you know, um, um, desired approach to this. Um, let me just go next. And sorry, have I missed one? No, I think I've missed something here. No, sorry, that's right. Um, and then look, you know, why is this relevant today? Because you know the good what we're trying to do in the Good Governance Academy's training approach is is deal with what are currently business critical topics, and. These two quotes, Frank shared something just recently from PwC. Maybe mention that in a moment, Frank. I'll just talk to the first yeah. one. Mm -hmm. It's something we just spotted. We just pick up, you know, McKinsey's things from time to time. And it's not, look, it's not like the analysts are always right or the top firms are, all, are perfect, but sometimes they come up with statements that are really, you know, eye-opening. And and I sort of sensed this was probably the case, but I hadn't realized that, you know, statistically it's it's sort of as bad as it is. But the real truth is, that most of these digital transformations haven't resulted in successful outcomes. Unfortunately, you know, anything with an IT project component for years has not always been successful. The general rule of thumb is that perhaps one in four actually might be successful. And it's not only that they don't meet the objectives, they often waste colossal amounts of money. 
And Norman, Frank, maybe talk to you know, PWC's point. Yeah, well, I think the PWC point, which is the third bullet on the slide, uh, they do an annual global CEO survey, the 27th annual survey, which just came out January 15th. Um, in that, they revealed that 45% of the CEOs believe their company will not be viable in 10 years if they stay on their current path. And the reality is the failure of large initiatives in companies has been colossal over many, many years. I mean, some companies have failed completely as a result of these large initiatives. And now the health and vitality of these companies is at risk if they can't actually achieve these transformation objectives. Because at the end of the day, it's going to come down to the productivity of the workforce, how fast you can move, how much you get done, and how, how effective you are at deploying these new technologies like AI into your business. Because if you can't do it successfully, you're going to be woefully underperforming versus those who do this well. And, you know, it's a lot of it is going to come down to good governance over the investments, you know, over the talent and culture, over the way people work, over what gets funded, how people are held accountable, how they collaborate. All of this is going to drive the success or failure of these organizations. And I think that quote just tells you that the CEO sense they can't continue to do things the way they've been doing them. It's not going to work. Yeah. So look, so let's move on to the approach I've taken. And, and look, this approach, it took months of thinking and uh, and is an approach that's the same for all the guides we're working on. There are several of these, including one on good governance. The one today we're focused on is the first one, digital transformation. And those of you who have any history with COVID might remember a, a spin-off initiative that was called Val IT. This is quite a long time ago, but it was uh, an initiative to try to take COVID to the value portion. And a gentleman called John Thorpe, uh, who is, lives in Canada and uh, is a kind of guru in the whole value management space, he, we found this, found him and asked him to, to lead this. He's now just turned 80. I've always in touch with him. He's, a, he's a, another passionate guy who's been trying to persuade executives just to see the sense of certain things. And he wrote a book called The Information Paradox. And in the Information Paradox book, he, he coined the idea of following the four R's, which I've summarized on this slide. And this is, the, these slides, by the way, are taken, they're like screenshots, or some of them are screenshots of the actual uh, course material. Um, but uh, it's about doing the right thing. And look, and I, over the years, because governance sometimes is misunderstood badly, and can even be a negative opening, you know, statement, it's like, oh, you know, here comes bureaucracy. Here comes red tape. Overhead. Here comes it's overhead. negativity. Yeah, yeah exactly. and it's all about compliance. It's all about risk. So so for quite a long time, I've been not using um, governance as the entry, but I'm just saying, look, can't we just do the right thing, which I think is what good governance really is. But what he did was break it into these four elements, which is doing the right things first. So we're doing the right objectives. We're then going about them in the right way. And it's architecturally meaning, you know, all the all the capabilities that we should have. It's not just technology, especially in digital transformation. The bulk of it is people change and probably process change. And then the third element is, and are we delivering that well? You know, are we sustaining it? Is it is it operating smoothly? Is it is it functioning um, um, in a productive way? Are the people engaged and and even as Frank would say, having some fun and enjoying themselves is they go home from to work thinking they've been fully satisfied, not going home to work thinking I'm drained or waking up in the morning and saying, oh, my God, not another day at work, you know. Mm -hmm. And then the last part is, and have we delivered what we promised? Have we created the outcomes and the benefits that we said we would when we started with our so-called strategic planning? And so what I've done in this guide and in all the guides is break down the content into four sections based on those four R's. I'm not going to go through. Look, and these slides will be shared, by the way, so don't worry about, you know, scribbling down some notes, perhaps. But break down, I, we break, I've broken down the three, sorry, the four R's into three topics. Three is a bit of a magic number. It's always, you know, if we keep it down to three, it might be digestible. <laughs> And then the other breakthrough that, that went through my mind was to present it like a cookbook. It's kind of weird. You know, my, my, the one hobby I've got 
to get me out of work is to make myself nice food and, and for friends as well. So I'm always playing around with cooking. And a, a big piece of work I did for Johnson & Johnson, at the, <clears throat> at the end, we wanted a giveaway. And I said, well, why don't we do a cookbook? And that's what we did, a very simple cookbook. And the ladies in the team at Johnson & Johnson suggested these titles. Let's just describe it as, here's how, which is like the recipe. This is what you need, which is like the essential ingredients. And what can go wrong is a bit like the cook's tips. You know, don't forget to do this or that because, you know, it could go horribly wrong. And so that's how the material is presented. And the idea in all this material for executives is to avoid any technical language whatsoever, avoid lots of content, keep it down to not too much material. In fact, there's about 80, 80 pages to the, or 80 slides, however you want to call it, to the content each time. Um, and make it interactive. So we're using, I haven't got the time today to go into all the technicalities, but we're using very latest thinking on, on educational techniques. So these are interactive eBooks. We're using AI tools to help produce uh, things like audio clips. Um, and so each so-called page, and this is, this is a screenshot, will have maybe an audio clip. This is another, uh, colleague of ours who's really, really good at presenting, Kip Fanta. Every page will have an audio clip, which is down the bottom here. And and sometimes there'll be a small amount of text. Sometimes there'll be, you know, another kind of, just an image that tries to make an impact. Um, but the idea is to try to stimulate while under, passing on some understanding. We've also asked John, when we were showing all this to John Thorpe, uh, he said, Gary, look, this is great and it is really good, but it can. It, there are some people who won't even go through this. So some people only want to see one or two things. So we, we thought about that for a couple of weeks and then we came up with the idea, luckily the tools provide this, of having like a question set at the beginning. So trying to prompt, uh, if, have you dealt with this? If the answer is no, press the button, and then you'll go straight to the three or four slides or pages that deal with that particular point. So it's almost like a, you know, taking you through the flow. Um, if I go to the next one, this is just with a diagram, talking about strategic planning and trying to get the point across that it would help to have one converged strategy and certainly a business strategy that embraces digital. So it's not just a technical you know, description, a so-called IT strategy or, you know, often called by the system that they've used, like the SAP project or the SAP plan, you know, it's a the business strategy for whatever the digital intent would be, it might be the, the business strategy for improving our logistics or our custom, customer connectivity or whatever it is. Um, and so that's an example of what you might need as an ingredient. And then I think the last one is, uh, what can go wrong where we're just using an image and and la the last thing I'm going to say and then we'll move on in a second now to some questions and discussions was that the traditional training and this was particularly challenging I think especially even as a, as a presenter is to have to cram everything into say two three or four days and typically because of exam criteria lots of information a typical two-day certified class might be 300 PowerPoint slides and it has to be done somehow in two days and then a test. So what we're doing is, is more like a driving manual. It's, it's almost like a YouTube thing that you can go back to whenever you like, you know? I don't think, so the, the idea is that the access would be always available. It can be continually updated instantly like a piece of software. Um, so it's always current. Because I think people will have issues from time to time. They might want to think, well, maybe I'll go back to this point because it's now become a bit of a problem. So, so we're being pretty bold here to try and reinvent, um, you know, how people learn and how the particularly senior people might might find this as a helpful, you know, uh, thing to have on the side. So look, I hope that sparked a little bit of thinking. Um, Let's go on to some discussions. So, Frank, I don't know if, and be provocative to us as well if you don't agree with us or if you think there's something you could add or whatever. We're open. This is a really, you know, good opportunity for us to get get your mm -hmm. thoughts. And 
we've got a good turn there's about 120 people dialed in which is fantastic that's really really nice yeah super um, so frank i don't know if you had a chance to have a look at the chat box yet or see if there's any questions have we got any questions just, uh, just if not we'll ask questions of each other uh I'll stop sharing as or maybe I'll keep it open. Well, let's stop sharing. Yeah, currently you've done that. Uh, da, da, da. <clears throat> Sorry, I'll maybe any I can ask. Yet. You, no, sure. maybe I can. Uh, maybe I can ask one. Um, so Frank, in your experience, and obviously you've been C CIO of of various uh in various organizations, um. And Stephen's got a question about the training, but just in terms of your experience, and you spoke a little bit about uh, the people angle, and I'd like to ask a question in terms of the education angle, and I know that People Productive has got that people angle, but mm -hmm. in terms of your role and what your experience is, would something like this, just this kind of education be useful to the uh, people that you've been managing in your role? Yeah, there's no question. I think people need um, a very good guidebook like this on how to approach these large transformations. Um, those those four R questions are really the ones that companies have to get right. And when you look at organizations, they really run through talent, culture, and governance. Those three dimensions are the ones that really drive the success or failure of the company, and they're all supported by collaboration. And so making sure everybody's on the same page in terms of the approach of how they're going to do things, which is what this establishes, is very important. It makes it clear who the owners are, that you can't walk away and delegate these things to other people, that as executives, you actually own it. And that may mean you're going to have to get into quite a bit of detail at some point um, on these in order to be an effective driver. But yes, education and getting people on the same page is very, very important and having a simple approach to it, which I think, you know, this executive education online has really nailed down with the Good Governance Institute is exactly what's needed. Thanks, Frank. Uh, I see there are some questions that have come in. Gary, um, first of all, to Stephen's point, is the training available now? Yes, it's available online using mm -hmm. the link that I put in the chat. Um, there's a question here to Gary from Glenn. How can you certify or demonstrate that the participant has mastered the material and applied the knowledge, i.e. knowledge management? So do you have any kind of certification process at the end of it? Obviously, the, the Good Governance Academy provides a certificate of attendance or completion of the course and not certification per se. But is there any certification associated with this course? No, the short answer is no, there is not. And Glenn, it's a good question. And and I like the way you worded it specifically because, because I think I'm guessing you're on the same page as me, is that there's no real certification other than proof of, ha of being able to do it, you know, do something that, you know, you, you've got the competence and you've applied it. It's something we've got to think about, I think, and even in the training academy for the, for the Good Governance Academy is how to deal with that. ISACA have done some things with this, you know, um, but for the moment, no, no. And uh, maybe that's something, Carolyn, we could even, you know, start to get some discussion on in general, because because if we could come up with something that that is that, that could be done practically and is useful, it would be great. I just find that, unfortunately, a lot of the so-called certifications are just certificates. Yeah. based on a test and often the test is just a memory test and even the so-called practitioner tests are just a test of a scenario you know and applying what you've been told against the scenario whereas a, something that you're describing is is real proof of application it's got to have some independence as well uh, but anyway the answer quick, quick answer is no but i think we should kind of look into it yeah <laughs> I think that's definitely worth exploring because there are ways of measuring things and gathering mm. data and being able to show trends and changes over time. So, you know, I believe, you know, we could dig into this and figure out a way to measure it, measure it and then provide actual certification of effective practice. I mean, the, the maybe to mention, Frank and Carolyn, the, I'm, we're, we're, I'm connected to the BRM Institute 
And these institutes, you know, we have I have ups and downs because sometimes it's it's a it's a problem of being of having to sort of push some theory as opposed to some practice. But the BRM Institute came out with a, quite a nice idea, which is the initial step is certificates of experience. And so the idea is that you do like a case study write up and you have someone independently verify it. Uh, that you've achieved something, you know, one particular thing. So I did this particular thing and I've done it, you know, and then you build those certificates up to the level of I've done a number of these things and I have acquired um, proof of real change being going back to the measurement, Frank, is because the real proof is the organizational change has happened. You know, this is the other thing that's always been my my ultimate goal, you know, is that what we do has helped someone to improve, but the proof has been that their organization has benefited and a change has actually happened for the better, you know? And and there are some examples I know of, you know, uh, but that, that would be the ultimate proof that it's a bit like a doctor can say, I've done you know enough patients to prove that I these people did well, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, you know, that that's the ultimate goal, I think. Um, Gary, would you mind just um, sharing with us a little bit more details around that one page that you had with the wheel turning? Um, Should I go share the screen? Which one? The, yeah, the, please. The, 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 Thank you. Uh, so da, 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 really just delving again. into the topic of digital transformation. And um, obviously, you know, you, you gave a little bit of background to digital transformation. But can you give us a bit of background around why you believe that yeah, that one. Yes. That one. Let me just go Maybe full screen here. Thank you. Um, why why you believe that this particular model is so important for for digital transformation and and business strategy? Are they one and the same thing, or are they two separate things? Digital strategy and business strategy. Well, they so in real real life, unfortunately, they tend to be separated quite often, but. My whole hope would be that the day would come when we just call on business strategies and there's just the one high level business strategy it might have subsidiary elements to it. This picture Ike, is from McKinsey's. So it's their their content. I just felt it was a good example and and it kind of gives a, like an holistic view. And and it tends to talk to the things that are the, you know, the things that we want to come out of a transformation using the digital technology, some examples like improved targeting of customer insights or, um, you know, going back to what Frank touched on, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's improving processing, whatever it might be. Um, obviously, every organization has its own strategy and will have its own objectives and it will have its own uh, operating environment, et cetera. So everyone is unique. But if everyone were to do strategy with technology, Look, it's not just digital. This has been an issue for ever since I can remember <laughs> of, <clears throat> of having the business objectives separated from the IT objectives. And then because of a lack of involvement of the business side and an eagerness of the technical guys to be, you know, moving forward, that it gets driven by the technology. It gets driven by the solutions. We even name the projects after the product in the worst case. So, so yeah, you know, I think if everyone could just drop the idea of IT and technical and just talk about business all the time, everything is a bit, a technical, as John Thorpe would say, and this goes back 20 years or so, in the real world, everything is a technology enabled business change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm even thinking. more, it's a technology enabled <laughs> business investment, you know, which gives the value of it. Sorry, Carolyn. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, and, and you, Frank, in, in your practical uh, life, did you see that these separations? What was your experience? Well, my experience always was that, <clears throat> you know, IT was viewed as a separate endeavor because there were a lot of, you know, different elements and practices that the executives didn't understand and they felt they could delegate that to IT. And that resulted in this desire for IT and business to work better together for years. You know, what I always did is when we designed our organization, we embedded IT into the business called a federated organization because IT is simply the automated piece of the business. And when you look at a whole digital transformation, 
you know, you're really talking about a business strategy, as Gary said, and there are techno, techno, technical elements to it, but under the business strategy of all of your enterprise risk management, you have your compliance activities that you have to take care of. You have, you know, all of the things you're going to be doing in terms of transforming your talent. So there's an overarching strategy and there are technical elements to it, certainly. And over the years, we've seen the technology piece become a bigger and bigger part of the overall business strategy. Um, I've seen companies struggle from the beginning of time to apply technology and to get business value out of it because, you know, uh, Gary's slide, where you, are we doing the right things? Are we getting the right benefits? You know, companies have had a struggle from the beginning of time trying to nail down these components of the strategy and to prove out whether or not it's been effective. Most of the failures come down to a lack of collaboration. There are walls in these companies that need to come down. How you collaborate is a governance issue, right? They should have very clear strategy around their collaboration model in the firm. Uh, they need a culture where people can speak up. You need a lot of openness and candor. You need belonging. And regardless of what happens with AI, because that's just the latest element, you know, we've gone through this so many times we did with the, we're going to move on to the World Wide Web. And how are we going to really use social technologies to, <clears throat> to interact with our customers? Um, you can go through every generation of technology. This is the latest. And if companies don't really embrace this as a very deep collaborative effort, um, the reality is they're going to suffer the same failures they suffered every other time. This is a chance to actually do things right and really just talk about business because it's business outcomes. That's it. Absolutely. And something that you speak about in the training, Gary, is about um, optimizing investment returns. What are you mm -hmm. speaking about there in the training? So, you know, on the one hand, this is a discipline of you know, just taking due care over the use of resources. And um, and so, you know, basic steps like business cases, um, benefit planning, and then measuring and monitoring, you know, are we actually realizing all of those things? Um, for one reason or another, in a technology-driven initiative, and I, you know, I doubt that the statistics range in the upper 90s, um, percentage-wise, in terms of <clears throat> the numbers of people who don't do this. You know, the business cases tend to be um, um, done in such a way that that just to get it past the first first hurdle, always underestimating the real cost. They don't get maintained as conditions change. The benefits are not properly defined and are very hard sometimes to even comprehend in a measurement sort of way. And so people tend to put up their hands and say, well, we can't, it's too, too difficult. You know, it's too subjective, any old <laughs> excuse to avoid um, doing it. The truth is uh, that if you don't, it will go off track. I mean, it's, it's, it's as sure as it's cause and effect. Um, and, and there's a certain amount of um, going back to, you know, Frank's area of culture and, and so forth. There's a fear factor here. You know, that's most senior leaders see this, as a as a, a worry of a, a fear of this could be my last job, you know I'm gonna I'm gonna be held to account for this thing that doesn't work because they they haven't worked before so so maybe if I let someone else be responsible I can uh, avoid the you know the criticism or people who are actually engaged on the job in the middle of the project and this has happened so many times don't speak up and say guys this isn't working you know it's like it's like, and they even get into a culture of, uh, of, of, of excitement of things going wrong. It's it, it, so, so the people, and, and, we, and because of Frank's input to me and, and his team, you know, through this guide and the other guides, there's a thread of culture all the way through. So we've got to have things like psychology, not just the discipline, Carolyn, of, you know, having a business case, having a benefit plan, having the, the departmental owners, measuring things like they should you know and being own, owning that but also having psychological safety so when something goes wrong that's fine you know because it will go wrong that's how we learn and improve um if if we don't think that what we're planning to do is right that people should be allowed to speak up you know and we're in this together as a team it's not you or me or them or us and there's no finger pointing you know it's 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 and 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 then the last thing that that 
Frank, you know, made me finally the biggest wake up call of all was if you get the passion to realize that outcome, you know, so in other words, we're on a journey. If we can pull this thing off, boy, it's going to make a difference. You know, our company will improve. The people will will get better paid even or our customers will be delighted. And if that exists, then the benefit planning is natural. You yeah. know, if we want to see yes. we want to wait. We want to see the result. Absolutely. And so you, you've taken mm. Frank's um, learnings and really applied it. And maybe, Frank, you can tell us a little bit about the theory behind those those learnings that uh, Gary's applying. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I was a turnaround transformation CIO for most of my career. And what I realized on like my third transformation is that what I was actually fixing and transforming was the human side of IT. It was never, if there were technology problems, it was really always the human element that was the root cause, a lack of collaboration, a lack of openness. I realized that the people who worked for me understood everything about their business processes and their technology, but knew literally nothing about what really drove the productivity of their people. And that's really still an enormous blind spot in corporations. You know, leaders need to understand really how to get the best out of their people. That means there's a human dimension to this. And these human sciences are very important because, you know, for a hundred years, we've known an awful lot of things about how people think and make decisions. Now, you look at the root cause of failure of all these past transformations. It is a lack of collaboration. A lot of it had to do with very toxic environments where people were treated as interchangeable parts. Nothing could be further from the truth. Humans are assets that should be grown. There are roles in companies that are becoming you know, less of an asset because they're no longer producing value, old technologies and things um, that <clears throat> are part of the legacy of the company that eventually have to go away. And those people need to be reskilled and upskilled and moved into roles where they can actually be productive and add value to the company. But companies treat people as parts. And if you do that, there's no psychological safety. If there's no psychological safety, then companies are operating at level two of Maslow's hierarchy, which is lack of safety. They need to be really up at level four, which is esteem. That means achievement driven. And as you move up through Maslow's hierarchy into level three out of level two, that is where you begin to get a sense of belonging, where people start to collaborate in an open and honest way. That means that from a governance perspective, you need to have a very good set of defined values and norms that people lead by and work by. And you've got to define how people work together because companies fail to do that. They leave it really to individual leaders and they don't measure their culture on an ongoing basis. And so they've lost governance and the ability to control it. And if you measure the culture and you link the culture measurements to the business outcomes, now you have a tool that says, hey, we can turn human capital into business results. That means everybody is an asset of the company. They're assets that should be grown, that we're gonna grow institutional knowledge, that we're gonna rely on our people to get this work done. And we're gonna build a culture where people really perform in a very deep and meaningful way. And that's the key to any transformation. Uh, digital transformation starts with culture. You've gotta have a culture of collaboration, psychological safety. You wanna have your people operating at a high level of organizational energy, which is passion and mood, they both need to be calibrated and be very high, as Gary said, because that energy is going to drive the journey to transform the company. you got to maintain that level of energy at a very high level throughout the transformation. And you need to design the transformation based on really cognitive neuroscience. You know, one of the other reasons for failure is they try to tackle, you know, an elephant instead of starting with one hoof and building it and having it in a way that humans can wrap their head around it because human conscious capacity is limited. It's about you know 60 to 90 bits per second, whereas a subconscious runs at 10 billion bits per second of information processing. So humans can handle really three, four things consciously at one time. And when you put together a group of people and say, hey, we're going to think about these hundred things and figure out what to do with them. Very few people can wrap their head around it. And that's where these big transformations bog down. They slow down to nothing. And ultimately they fail because the company just can't continue to invest money in it because they get nowhere. They're overtasked. 
But, you know, it's the human element and the culture that drives really the success of any of these initi initiatives. The bigger they are, the more important the culture is, honestly. And designing that transformation around the way people, the way people think and work. That's the name yeah. of the game here. Using and Karen, those maybe just, if I just chip the, in the on... that that's the secret source. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, true. And 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 Carolyn, I think the other thing, and look, and I and it is explained in 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 the material is that the reality is that everyone's on a continual transformation. There is no such thing even as a strategy plan, you know, that stands still. Um, it's the real world is that it's continual. And one of the things that I really liked another quote from McKinsey's that I I use in the in the material is agility as opposed to the agile you know methodologies agility is this continual ability to readjust and so as a leader the other thing you know and, and partly is because of learning like mistakes partly is because something comes out of left field that we didn't realize because you can't anticipate now the speed of change it's, it's always been continual but i think the speed seems to have increased partly because of technology um, or something could happen in the business that says hang on a minute you know we, we need to do something else or unfortunately our performance has dropped. So we need to, um, you know, maybe scale back for the moment. And so um, it becomes, it's a continual, which is also why I think education is a continual thing. It's not a one-off thing. You don't go on a class. And by the way, some of these so-called classes, it takes like four years for them to be changed sometimes. So, you know, they're already out of date by the time they've been produced. So what I'm striving for from an educational point of view is almost like continually updated education. If 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 this if this guide gets used by more and more people, as I hope it will, as a as a media to act to, and we get the feedback saying, well, did, did you realize this? Or have you thought of that? Or someone else comes up to me, or we realize we need to change, we just change it on the spot instantly. And instantly everyone has the new version. Because it's it's like a piece of software, you know? <laughs> It's this is the way education needs, needs to work, I think, and uh, and 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 this is the this is what transfer is about business change, continually happening, and yeah. and lastly, look, because uh, I'm sorry, but I get pretty passionate about these things. I think the the most important, not that you know, uh, almost the most probably is the most important part of even good governance is the culture, mm -hmm. because you know, and and. and Thankfully, uh, and Caroline, I don't I expect everyone's aware, you know, of the ISO standard that you drove with other people, you know, 37,000. It was really encouraging to me to, first of all, read a standard that could be read. Look, mm -hmm. it's not going to be read by our executives, but nevertheless, it could be read. It's, it's not difficult to read. And it emphasized culture throughout. Mm -hmm. That's unusual for an ISO standard. Um, um and and especially in in the current world of the you know the environment um social even digital you know the trans business transformations have to be cognizant of their social responsibilities just as much and the environment just as much as as it's part of the business outcomes you know to be seen to be a caring organization using technology properly and carefully um you know so that's what we've tried to pack into into 80 odd okay. slides um, and and so on with with short clips, short audios to spark, hopefully, you know, doing the right thing. Yeah, that sounds Sorry, brilliant, any... Gary. No, that's um, perfect. I, I just want to do a, a bit on the, the previous comment by Frank as well. Um, what do you do with detractors? Those people who are actively not going along with this digital transformation. Do you say anything about that, Gary, in your course? And Frank, what is your experience? Mm -hmm. Frank, you go go first. Okay. You know, people always resist change. They're always detractors. There is a point at which they really have to either be on the bus or off the bus, right? Because this is not an option for companies. They're going to have to undertake the digital transformation. It's going to be uncomfortable for some people because it's going to massively affect the jobs of many people. Um, a lot of jobs are going to be transformed. And, you know, I was um, I was working with a sales team and it became clear that um, like AI question was, is AI going to eliminate salespeople? No. Uh, but salespeople who really use AI effectively are going to eliminate salespeople who don't. And so I don't think anybody should resist change because it's fundamental to their long term success as well. 
They really need to think about how this is going to change what we do, and they should take a leadership role in helping drive that change and defining how these new technologies are going to change what they do and improve the operational effectiveness of the company. And so I'd say to any detractors, be careful. You're going to be left behind. I think it's very clear that's what's going to happen. Yeah, look, and Karen, I think the, the the key thing for me is communication. You know, that's what we in in the in the material. That's what we stress over and again. I've always followed John Cotter. It goes back a long way. Um, even in the COVID material, we we the implementation guidance for COVID was based on the John Cotter model. You know, the seven or eight steps. Um, and it's it's this, and it sadly doesn't happen. You know, even the strategy objectives often don't get cascaded down properly, and and people start to imagine. The worst you know i mean even ai of course is, is made people think oh my job's gone you know and and so it, it, it has to be the leader's role to explain you know beforehand and up front um you know a what the benefit is b what the challenge will be you know because challenges are, are bound to occur and and I suppose the look, this is part of my life as well. You know, if you don't take a risk, you don't move forward. <laughs> you know, if if you want to stay put, well, this is not the company for you, perhaps, because um, you know, sadly, the world keeps moving forward. And that's how opp opportunity the, I, there's a slide I use, which is the opportunity thing, you know, the gap between opportunity from John Cotter. So I, for me, it's in the course material, it's all about communication mm. and positive communication and and you know, change is beneficial, provided we go about it, you know, together. And togetherness is the same thing. You're not on your own in this change. Right. <laughs> it's, team. Right. it's a team. It's you know? been at the collaboration and engagement. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I think, to be honest, we're living at a, a, it's the thing that really I hope excites me the most is I think for the first time ever, we're on a threshold in our time now where this is, people talk about this all the time. It was even part of the COVID you know, story better together, um, and and you know, I think there's there's an appetite for better better things. Mm. But leaders, does the leaders need to be the ones that you know show the way, not to show the I way, know. but take you through the way. You know, that's what we're trying to get across. So, Frank's, did did you want to add, or I have another question? Yeah, I would just say when you, uh, you know, when you look at this whole era, it really is an age of disruption. And uh, the companies that survive will be the ones that disrupt themselves. The individuals that thrive will be the ones that disrupt themselves and uh, really take ownership of what's happening. I challenge every executive out there to go to their organization and challenge everybody in it to think about how AI is going to affect their role and be ready to talk about how it could improve the way they work. This shouldn't be left to people elsewhere in the organization to come into an area and say, I think you could apply AI this way over here. Um, every organization, and every person in the organization should be challenged to look at this because they do have a role to play in the digital transformation, whether it's supporting the change that is taking place, adding their own thought to it to improve it or helping drive it. And companies right. have to be able to move fast. And, you know, agility is very important. But the biggest piece of agility isn't going to be infrastructure agility. It's going to be human agility, the ability for mm. humans to react and change like we had to during COVID when everything changed very quickly. I think that proved how agile humans can be when things happen. But it's the human element then that is going to drive who wins and who loses. Because at the end of the day, the transformation isn't going to end. We've been through so many of them since the era of technology began, and it's speeding up. And I think we are on the threshold of really technology just becoming a part of how we do business and that separation between the technology organization and the rest of the company that we've seen over years is going to fade away because every company is becoming a technology company one way or another. Right, right. Um, mm. And Gary, just a last question around, mm. oh, let me put my camera back on. <laughs> just a last <laughs> question. So you've got the three strategies that you mentioned in, in the write-up on the course. And the last one is about um, organizational and operational and financial performance. And people are going to ask the question. I mean, that's financial numbers, even though we're working in an era of 
multiple capitals and looking at social and, and human and relational capital as being a capital that we need to deal with, um, financial capital is still very much in the forefront mm-hmm. of everybody's mm-hmm. minds. How does this uh, course help people in terms of the strategy around that financial performance side of things? Well, it, it, look, it, it goes back to the the, the benefit Look, it manifests itself at the end in the benefit realization or get what we call getting the benefits. Are you getting the benefits? And obviously financial benefits are a key element here, including that not having a financial loss would be a benefit, you know, because uh, and I can tell you the amount of money that's lost globally. And it's no different in South Africa to anywhere else or around the world. It's generally the same kind of ratios, uh, just different currencies. But it's a lot of a lot of wasted um real money real money you know money spent on certain things but the 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 financial benefit obviously depends on what the outcome that you're striving for at the beginning so if the outcome for example was i want to improve my supply chain i mean there are ways to measure that you know financially and it can be significantly important financially and can be measured the thing is that the other habit of any kind of change especially if we call them projects, which is an unfortunate word. I think I'm wondering whether that's going to disappear. You know, that's another, you know, over a beer brainstorm, you know, because projects have this kind of finite kind of thing. And and what you see in reality is that the teams disband when they produced the, the deliverable. Of course, the measurement and the, the actual creation of the financial benefits only begin when you start to operate whatever it is that you've transformed. And it may take several years even. And that moves on to the 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 what we might call the sustainable owner, you know, the one, the manager or the team that's actually operating the new environment, that they have a you know a desire and a passion and a measure and an ownership of making sure the results take place. And what happened every single time extra things have to be done. Um, I can remember one of our retailers here locally, you know, I'm in Cape Town, like, like what well, Carolyn would normally be. <laughs> um, one of the local retailers told me a good story, you know, and I'll maybe quickly capture this in two seconds, is, you know, when when they open a new store, and I'll, I'll jump to the end of this, which is the last part, it's the store manager's job to reach the target that was promised when the marketing people said, if we open a new store in ABC location, we can get some new business. That gets tested, you know, in a business case. Someone then says, okay, I think that sounds plausible. We'll invest in it. That turns into some kind of initiative that, you know, includes building the store, hiring the people, doing marketing campaigns, et cetera, et cetera. And then the day the store opens, it's the manager's job there from that day on. But also the leaders, they come to the store on the day of opening, hoping and praying that the place is packed. And it never, I I think they said, it's never, ever happened that what they expected occurred in the first few months. They have to swing into action. And that's what has to happen. And that's another governance thing. You know, you steer the ship, but you've got to keep it on track and you've got to keep replenishing and you've got to keep, you know, this whole sustainability thing. So sorry, I've gone on a bit there, but... But that's yeah, I see we're running out of time now. Actively, I would add, uh, I would, yes, I would add one thing in terms of the financial and human capital. Mm. You know, if you look at that 27th annual uh, global CEO survey that PwC did, one of the things in there that matches all of the work that we've done is they found that CEOs felt about 40% of the time and energy invested by their people was being consumed inefficiently. And that really is true. You know, we study and we measure culture. We measure the productivity of organizations. And what we see is that most companies really operate at around a B minus. And, you know, you find that really on average, uh, really 40 to 50 percent of the time people spend is not generating any kind of return for the company. It's time wasted in meetings, waiting for decisions, you know, governance over decisions, very important decision-making speed that drives organizations. People are interrupted all day long, which means they can't really focus. They're given 12 things to do when they can probably manage three at a time. So they're in kind of this fog of work. And if you said, uh, here's a company with a $10 million payroll, 
you're really losing $4 million of that human capital investment. And the leaders have to understand what drives the productive use of talent, how to maximize the productivity and efficiency of their organization so that they can generate much higher returns on human capital. Because that financial capital really is bringing in the human capital. Most of the time, it's not buying plant and equipment these days, although certainly there are real industrial companies around, but more and more they're digital. So 80% of the expense in these companies is on people. And those higher returns on human capital matter because that's how people will ultimately thrive, mm. right? It's the return on the capital that creates a thriving organization. And it used to be the return on the financial capital or the capital equipment in a company. Now it's the human capital that's mm. really driving whether the company thrives or not. So it's a very important question at this moment in time. How are companies going to maximize returns on all forms of capital in their company? Absolutely. Yeah. And with that, we've run out of time. So I need to say thank you very much for um, being online. Thank you, Gary, for uh, putting this course together, for presenting it to us today. Thank you, Frank, for giving us that people yeah. perspective and um, just giving us the practical perspective as well from a CIO, um, from the CIO role. Um, yeah. Really, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. The video will be available on the event page, and we're all looking forward to joining and to seeing this course. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Carolyn. Thank you.